but uh, Constitution Day is actually this Friday, and this is where uh, everybody is encouraged to sort of talk about the Constitution, think about it. Uh, we don't have a lot of people on campus on Friday, and so we decided to do it today. So thanks for being here. I really appreciate uh, all of that. And what I've got for us today is, uh, this will last kind of as long as is, is interesting to you. I've got a little discussion on some basics of the Constitution. I've got a little chunk here on, we'll, we'll, we'll go through a few questions that I've got that, that I think are interesting and you guys can try to answer. And then I want to open it up, you know, at the end, whatever you guys want to talk about. You can ask me, ask each other. Hopefully it won't devolve into a shouting match, but if it does, at least it'll make for a good video for our YouTube channel, right? So, <laughs> uh, so that's what we're going to do. So Constitution Day, uh, Constitution Day 2011, right? Uh, or the day I learned what the government is actually supposed to uh, do. So I've got some basics. I'm not going to cover like the entire history of the Constitution because we did that. We'd be here for like 15 or 16 years, and we've only got an hour. So uh, I'm just going to cover kind of the basics of this, all right? Some of the basic information behind this. Uh, the U.S. Constitution was actually the second constitutional document uh, in American history. The first was called the Articles of, of Confederation, where the different states in the middle of a war for independence against Britain had signed this kind of basic outline of how they were going to manage the national government. Right? And when you look at how that went into effect, they were fighting against King George III of England. They were fighting against the practices that both the king and the parliament were visiting upon them. And so basically, the Articles of Confederation was very much a reaction in the opposite direction. And so as a result of that, once the war ended, the Articles government just kind of kept on going, okay? But over the course of time, it became increasingly apparent that there were a number of inherent flaws in the Articles of Confederation. And the reason for that is it was weak. It was a very weak government. There was a lot that the government was, the federal government was prohibited from doing. Now the reason for that was it was done that way on purpose. These were people that had just fought a war against a very strong, powerful central government that was literally trying to kill them. And so, as a result of that, their reaction in the opposite direction was, well, strong central government is bad, it causes people to die, and so we're going to have a very weak central government. We're going to let the states run everything, right? But then, as time went on, they realized that our government can't do really anything, right? Uh, it didn't have the power to lay taxes, so it couldn't gather its own money, right? It couldn't even control the money supply. So actually, after the war, there were 13 different state currencies. There was no United States money. Uh, and in fact, the states, in return, allowed a number of local banks and private firms to issue their own cash. So it was an extremely confusing economic situation. Nobody was really in charge. Uh, they were limited also, for example, there was no executive. So you had no president. They were very fearful of the king, an executive person. He runs us, he tells us what to do, he hangs us from the tree if we're bad. So any kind of executive is bad. So they didn't have it. You just didn't have it. The idea was that Congress would pass a law and you'd just, you'd just do it because it was law. Nobody was going to make it. There was also no judicial branch. They didn't have any kind of federal court system because all the states have courts. So it should all work out, right? Whenever there's a question about that or whatever, where it happens, the state court can handle it. But then, what happens if there's an issue involving more than one state? Yeah, oh yeah, that's not really a good idea. So, these were some problems, and they got together, and the Constitution was designed to fix them, right? So when they put this together, for example, one of the things they came up with was branches, right? There were branches for the federal government, uh, legislative, judicial, and the executive, right? They had, had a legislative, it's sort of a contract between you as a citizen and the government that they will defend your liberty, and, as, and in return, you will be a citizen right, under that government. Right? But they don't, it doesn't come from the government. It doesn't come from uh, the Constitution itself. Right? It comes from you being a person. Right? The early concept, the concept that, that still a lot of people hold to, is that uh, the idea of special creation branch before. Right? This time, it's basically going to be the same. It's just divided into two houses where the people are going to be represented in one, and the states are going to be represented and the other one. But basically, the legislative branch uh, is going to be the one where the laws originate. They're going to get together, they vote on what the law of the land is going to be. All right? It would actually have a judicial branch. There would actually then be not only federal courts, but then there would also be a Supreme Court, basically over everybody. So that way, 
uh, they would be able to determine you know, if there's a case involving you know, multiple states or people that cross state lines involving federal laws and not just state laws, they would be able to handle this. And more importantly, the creation of an executive, an executive branch. We actually have a president of the United States. A lot of people were very nervous about this. Wait a minute, what if you get too much power in this kind of thing? The, the concept was that there would be checks built into all of these so that, that one of the branches could not overlord, at least not very easily, over the other. Okay? So the legislative branch passes a law. The judicial branch can then uh, exercise its legal authority over it. The executive can he had a veto power so that anything that he felt was, was a bad law coming out of Congress, he could veto it. But also, if they wanted to, the Congress, if they were over really sure that this is what they want to do, by a two-thirds majority in both houses, they can override a veto. So it's a check against a check, if you will. Right? Congress was given the tiebreaker. Right uh, in all of this, because they have the impeachment power. Right, so if you're uh, just a rotten, low-down, dirty skunk, and you find yourself in political office, Congress has the power to kick you out. Right, so they're the ones that can do all of this, but they have to really be sure to do that. You have to get one impeached by the House of Representatives and then convicted in a trial in the Senate. For example, uh, how many presidents have we had that have been impeached? One is a good guess. It is wrong. Two. Two. We've had two. We've had two presidents impeached. Andrew Johnson, uh, in the eve of the wake of the Civil War, was impeached uh, by, uh, he had been a Democrat, a Southerner, and then he finds himself as president because Abraham Lincoln got himself shot. And so the Northern Republicans running Congress impeached him. They came one vote shy, though, of conviction, right? Who was the second one impeached? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, right? Bill Clinton was uh, impeached for, I know there are a lot of salacious uh, details with it, but the real reason was he lied to a judge, right? And it doesn't really matter about what, right? Whether you tie your shoes, whether you, uh, you know, pay the taxes on time. If you don't believe it, you guys can go to lie with judge today and see what happens to you, right? Uh, 20 years is probably going to be uh, the ballpark figure for that. So he was impeached by the House of Representatives, put on trial in the Senate, but they didn't get enough votes uh, to convict him either. So we had two presidents impeached. We haven't had any convicted and kicked out of office. We had a lot of other government officials, though, impeached and kicked out of office, both in Congress uh, and off the federal court system. Usually for corruption, you know, taking money, using their influence for personal gain, you know, that kind of thing. And that's what it's designed to do. These branches all can check each other, and of course, to get into the judicial branch, you have to get nominated by the president. And I'll give you a quick hint. Presidents don't pick people that they don't like and they don't agree with. So that's a check on the court system as well, all right? One of the major problems that they had, the states were all arguing with each other because you have, uh, already by that point, you had big states and you had small states. And if you represent it by population, then the small states are worried that the big states are just going to tell us what to do. Whereas if you allow equal representation by the states, then all of a sudden, you know, the few people that live in Rhode Island have the same number of uh, votes in Congress, they have the same say as like a huge number of people that live in Virginia. This, this, was, this isn't fair. Why should people's votes in Rhode Island count more than a person's vote in Virginia? And so this, this actually at the convention, when they got together in this hot, smelly room in Philadelphia, uh, this threatened to break the whole thing up. There, were, there was actually talk at one point that the big states, many of which didn't even touch each other, will we'll form one country and the little states will form a different country. Because that's a good idea on perhaps some other planet, but not the one that you and I live on, right? So what they decided to do was they said, I tell you what, uh, let's just say, screw it and do both, right? So like when you and your friends get together, it's like, I want pepperoni, no, I want pineapple and ham. I want pepperoni, pineapple and ham. Let's do half the pizza and pepperoni, half the pizza and pepperoni and ham. That's what they decided to do. So we get a house and a Senate. Because on the one hand, us as citizens, we are all equal in the United States. There's no one that has any kind of special advantages, at least not as far as the law is concerned. But the states are also equal as well. No one state is any more important than any other state. So that's what, that's what they do. You've got the House of Representatives is apportioned by population, and that's the purpose of the census that we take every 10 years, right? I mean, there's a lot of other fun stuff that you get to fill out, like how much money you make, uh, you know, what your favorite rock band is, you know, all that kind of crap that's on that, like, 20-page uh, thing that you fill out every 10 years. But the main thing is to determine, okay, which states get how many representatives, because as people move around or as more people are born in an area, you know, that kind of thing, population shift. Right? Our state of Florida, we continue to pick up people because people continue to move here. Right? And so we continue to pick up representation. Right? States that lose population, like New York and Michigan, they, they lose representatives. 
okay, as a result of that. Now, the Senate, on the other hand, is done by state. Every state gets two. Our state, right, has two, despite the fact that we're the fourth most populated state in the union. We have two. Wyoming, which doesn't even have enough people in it to garner two representatives, they have two votes as well. So all states are equal in that regard. Another important factor on this is the way that our citizenship is determined, okay, is an important factor. Since we have a say, both in the state government and in the federal government, and they are somewhat independent of each other, we actually have dual citizenship in the United States. You're a citizen, obviously, of the country, right? But you're also a citizen of your state, whatever state you live in. And this is an important kind of uh, way that the government gets its power and its authority, which is we elect people to Washington, we elect people to Tallahassee. So this is, this is an important uh, little factor with this, okay? So why is the Constitution put together the way that it is? What exactly is it designed to do? The number one thing that these guys determined, the whole point of this is to defend individuals' liberty. When they declared independence from England in 1776, the Continental Congress, why are you doing this, right? Well, King George's government infringed on our liberty, right? It took a whole bunch of our stuff away, right? Uh, he treated us badly in ways that the government is actually supposed to protect, they attacked. So if you're going to then separate yourself from that government and create a new one, it has to protect people's liberty. That's the whole point of the government. It's got to defend your liberty. It's got to defend your rights. Okay. So what they found was the Articles of Confederation government did a pretty bad job of defending their liberty. Right? They thought it was going to do a good job by not creating a very large government, but in fact, it didn't create a government that was big enough to create to uh, defend your liberty. So they went on and they said, well, what, what kind of government do we need to have? We need to have a strong union of the states. The states need to be together. Otherwise, other countries will put, push us around. What good is it if there's no tyrant here in America, right? If you don't have any sort of tyrannical central government in America, but we get pushed around by the French and the Spanish. Who, what does it matter who is taking your liberty away? Right? So they determined that the best way to do this was a union of the states, a strong union uh, under a federal government. So to that end, one of the things that they dedicate themselves is to preserve the union in ways that where all states will be treated equally, all citizens will be treated equally, and the federal government can operate in such a way as it can do that. Right? For example, every January, February or so, right, uh, we have a big show that goes on TV, right? The President of the United States he gets on national TV, ruins our prime time lineup of stuff that we want to watch, right? For the State of the Union Address, right? This is actually required by the Constitution. The Constitution says the President shall, from time to time, uh, report to Congress on the State of the Union. Now, for the most part, we use this today as kind of a political show. Right? Whoever's president of the United States at that point gets to go up and talk about what's going on with the country, how we're doing. They get a lot of applause for the things that one side agrees with, and then they get a lot of applause when he says something that the other side agrees with. It's kind of a show. Okay? We really, at least in our current political climate, we don't really need it for its original purpose, which was, hey, how is the union of the states going? Are we going to break up? That was the whole idea. And actually, for a long time, it was a non-event. Most presidents didn't even make the address in public. Because all it's required to do was report to Congress. They would write it out, they would hand it to some dude, he would go down, and he would read it in front of Congress. And they were, for the most part, short, and, and you know, except for like right before the Civil War. I think the Union is going to fall apart, people. You know? <laughs> Other than that, for the most part, the State of the Union, it turns out, has been, especially since the Civil War is over, has been kind of a non event, right? We've used it for political purposes where they say, well, the State of our Union is strong because our economy is good or bad or whatever. Well, unless you think the economy or whatever's going on in the war on terror or something is going to like pull the states apart from each other, it really technically doesn't have a whole lot to do with this, right? So the purpose of the Constitution is, though, to preserve the union of the states through its processes, okay? Another one of the things that uh, it's really, really important to do is to protect the minority from the majority, all right? Now, when they get these guys together and they say, okay, we're going to have a government, how are we going to do this? Well, if we're all equal, the only real fair way to do this is to vote, right? Uh, should we spend the extra money on this or not, right? Yay, nay, right? And then whoever gets over 50%, they're going to win, right? But there are, there are a lot of things that the government can do, okay, that 
are pretty scary. You know, you, you can maybe, you know, given points throughout history, you can get a majority of people in any room to vote for some pretty horrendous things, okay? Uh, people get worked up emotionally, right? Uh, we've got, we're going through kind of a rough period in our national history right now where there's real high unemployment, right? Uh, the economy is pretty bad. People get kind of spooked, and you might be able to convince you know, a whole room full of people, just a little over half of them, you know, we really need to drown all the kittens in the river. You know, years later, what were we thinking, right? You get, trust me, it's, you go through life, eventually you reach a point where, what was I thinking, right? It's actually not that hard to get a whole group uh, of people to do this, okay? So what happens is, when you delineate, there are certain lines that you can't cross with a bare majority. Just because one political party wins power in Congress and they win, for example, the, the presidency, they don't need to go and vote and say, you know what would really be making things easier for us is let's just go, you know, hang all the members of the other party. We won't have any more political trouble after that. Well, yeah, that's a brilliant idea. The French actually did this in their own little revolution, right? They started guillotining people in the streets that didn't agree with them. Well, we won, you know, we have the government now, and so we're just going to start guillotining all of you that disagree with us. So the Constitution is designed that Listen, yes, you get to run the normal day-to-day -day affairs if you get a majority. That, we, we understand that we have to you know, pass a budget, you know, defend the nation, and all that kind of stuff. But you don't get to go and trample on people's liberties just because you get a majority. Okay? The minority, then, is going to be protected from the majority. And the only way that you can then do that is to pass a constitutional amendment, which requires a super majority, a huge number of people from all across the nation to basically say, yeah, you know, we need to do that. So, that's, that's one of the major purposes here of the Constitution. Not only to defend your liberty, but also in some cases to defend your liberty from each other, right? Uh, for this kind of thing. All right, so we talked about this. What are rights and liberties, right? Well, the Bill of Rights was actually a very early sticky point in trying to get the, cost, the new Constitution ratified. These guys get together, they write it, right? And then they send it to the states to say, okay, who is going to follow this, right? Uh, how are we going to, you know, you've got to adopt this and use this as our new national blueprint. Okay? And in many of the early states, they were saying, wait a minute, you say you're going to defend rights and liberties. What are they? The original framers of the Constitution left it out, not because they weren't fans of rights and liberty, but just they didn't want to list them. They just, everybody knows what your rights are. But places like Virginia and New York and some of the other places, uh, they insisted, they said, look, uh, no, we need a list of specifically what is going to get protected and how, how is the federal government going to treat this, okay? And so basically the uh, framers of the Constitution, they sent word out and said, okay, look, if you put the new Constitution in effect, basically the first thing that we're going to do is we will, we will debate and add and propose a Bill of Rights for the states to ratify. So, okay, so the states that were really, really sticky on this point said, okay, we'll do this. And lo and behold, a bunch of politicians actually came through on a promise. One of the first things that they did was propose a Bill of Rights. I think there were 12 or 13 of them that they proposed. Ten of them were accepted by the states, and they're the ones that you and I would know as a Bill of Rights uh, today. So the question is, what is a right? Is this something you're born with, right? Where do rights come from? The concept is that you as your virtue as a person has it. Your rights don't come from the Constitution. The Constitution created by God, and so God endows people with certain inalienable rights. This is the language of the Declaration of Independence. Okay? So, what isn't a right? And there's actually a fairly short definition for that. Anything that you would want to do, you say, well, this, I have a right to do this, but if it impinges on the right of somebody else, then it's, it's not a right. Okay? For example, right? Freedom of speech, right? You have the right to say what you want when you want to, right? But I can't say, I would really like to shoot you. And then you, you, you call the police, right? It's like, it's crazy, he's up there, and he's talking about the Constitution, he threatened my life, right? And then the police come in and I say, no, 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 I have freedom of speech, I can say whatever I want. No, no, you have a right to be safe and secure and not have people running around talking about shooting you, right? Yeah, so my right to speak can't override your right, okay? Uh, current modern debate is a lot of people say, you have a right to an education. And while education definitely is a good idea, obviously I'm a big fan of it, right? Uh, you can't necessarily classify it as a right because it requires resources. At least the way that we've got it determined now is if I have a right to education, then that means I have a right to take some of your property to fund it. But I, no, I have a right to keep my property. No, no, no. I have a right to 
take it because see the, the two the two can't the two can't fight each other, right? Uh, Thomas Jefferson, when he was when he was asked uh, about how he thought freedom of speech should work, right? Uh, and his quote was, you know, if it neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg, meaning uh, if you don't say anything that's going to, that, if it's a lie that costs me money or that causes me physical harm or, or physical or fear of harm, then you can say whatever you want, right? Uh, so this is, a, this is a good example of kind of how rights work and how rights operate. Now, I'll give you a little hint. They aren't all listed in the Bill of Rights, right? Amendment number 10, uh, probably my, if not one of my favorites, uh, is basically what they wanted to include was this was an idea to all those people saying, wait a minute, if you list all these rights, what if we miss one, right? We can't list all of them, right? So basically what it says is that any rights not specifically mentioned here in the Bill of Rights, you're still protected under, okay? They devolve either on the people or on the states because not only do the citizens have rights, but states have rights as well. So that's how that operates uh, with what is this, right? So how does the government protect your Okay? One, physical defense. Right? You have the right to be alive and to have your freedom. Uh, and if somebody comes over here, a foreign army or something like that, and they point guns at you and say, okay, you got to do what we say now. The government's done a pretty crappy job of uh, defending your rights at that point. So you've got physical defense. And then also defense against other people in the country. Right? So law enforcement. These are ways that the government uh, defends your liberties. Right? What happens then is it creates what we would call a federalist system meaning that you've got two layers of government. You've got a federal government, right, a national government, and then you've got state governments. And in many cases, it's often explained in a, in a wrong kind of way. This is, this is the false form of federalism. The idea is that the U.S. and the national government sits on top, and then all the state governments you know, sit below it, and they do what the federal government says. There's a certain amount of truth in that, but the model as a whole is wrong. Okay? This is the actual way that federalism works. It's much more like a Venn diagram. There are some things that the United States government does all by itself. National defense, right? treaties with other nations, issues involving multiple states. These are the purview of just the federal government. But the states are also independent in a lot of ways. Local government, if it doesn't have anything to do with any other state, or it doesn't influence uh, anybody else uh, or a foreign nation or anything like that, it's up to the states. Right? The federal government, generally speaking, isn't supposed to have any role uh, in that. For example, education. Education is uh, up to the states, how they want to uh, do this. And you hear debates and things like that. For example, the school board in Kansas, they had a big debate over whether they were going to include creative des uh, um, intelligent design in their science textbooks alongside evolution. Federal government has really no say in, in the state of Kansas. They want to vote. They want to do that. That's up to them to determine their uh, to determine their educational course, just as an example of local government. Also, they are in charge of elections. So they're the ones that, that run the show as far as elections go. But then there's also this slice where there are some powers that both of them hold. For example, you can pay taxes to the federal government. And those of you that have a job, you do. Right? You can also pay taxes to the state government. Those of you that buy things here in Florida, you do. Right? There are a number of state taxes that are collected. So both of them have tax power. And they also have legislation. They almost both have a legislative power can pass a law. For example, the state of Florida can pass a law on what murder is or what murder isn't. Right? The federal government can pass a law on what the national budget is. Right? So they both have certain similar powers. But there have been a series of controversies, really from the time, you know, since the ink was dry on this. Okay? One of the problems here, uh, the big problems, is the idea of judicial review. What if Congress passes a law by a majority vote? And uh, either the president doesn't veto it, he signs it, or the Congress overrides it by a two-thirds majority, but it impinges on your freedom of speech. And he said, well, wait a minute, wait. that goes against part of the Constitution. You can't do that. I thought the whole point of the, the Constitution was to protect the minority, people that can be oppressed, just because we lost an election uh, from the majority, people that won. Okay? So who then is supposed to come in and fix this problem? Well, one of the issues here is the Constitution is actually pretty quiet on the subject, right? Very early on, people that weren't a big fan of a stronger federal government, guys like Thomas Jefferson, proposed the idea that, well, the states, the states can just nullify a law. Any law that is, can be passed by Congress, they can say, okay, that law that Congress passed in Washington 
no good here in the state of Kentucky, for example. We're just not going to follow it. And that would be their check against unconstitutional laws passed by the government. We can see the problem here in that, though. Any law that Congress passes that you just don't like, state legislature can vote and say, yeah, we're not going to follow that. Right? And we've seen it in a couple of times, uh, Virginia, Kentucky, and South Carolina have all tried to do that. And then the consequences is this isn't really a good way to do this. Okay? What has happened, and it's not in the Constitution, is the Supreme Court has absorbed this power unto itself. John Marshall, who was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in the early 1800s, issued a ruling that said, uh, yeah, this guy, he doesn't have to do this, right? Because the law that Congress passed requiring him to do so doesn't follow the Constitution. So there you go, right? You don't have to do it. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say a group of judges who are not elected by the citizens or by the states or by any other method, right, determines the constitutionality of laws and then using legal processes. Basically, that's, that's just the way that it is. Uh, to me personally, this is, this is something I really think the Constitution needs to, we need to address as a society. Is, like, is this really the best way to determine the constitutionality of laws? I mean, how are we going to do this? But this is, this is still a big decision. For example, you get a 7-2 Supreme Court decision in 1973 on abortion, right? That is still sort of roiling through society today, that you've got people very much in favor, very much against. Is this the way that we want to determine laws, constitutionality, what rights are? Another one is one that we really don't have to deal with, but of course was a, a major issue through the early part of the Republic, was slavery. And the problem with this, of course, is you've got, remember how I said a right can't conflict with another right, okay? And so the problem was slavery was in the early versions of the Constitution, how it was supposed to operate. And the U.S. Constitution is going to allow states, if you want to have slavery in your state, that's, that's okay, okay? Now, of course, the reason behind this being a problem is on the one hand, slaves are held as property, despite the fact they're human beings. Okay, they're held as property. So legally speaking, they're property. And on the other hand, though, wait a minute. If they're born here and they're people, and they were counted on the census as people, uh, shouldn't their rights as human beings, you know, their liberty be defended? So you've got these two issues that, that conflict with each other, right? It, it's what I explain in, for example, my African-American history. So it's a paradox. You either have one, you're either a person or a piece of property. You can't be both, okay? And so this was an issue that, uh, one, pit two different sets of rights against each other, but also then pit the states against the federal government, where you had ever increasingly a federal government led by Republicans saying, you know, I don't think a slavery thing, is, I don't think it fits with our idea of, of you know, uh, what it is to be an American. And then, of course, you've got a lot of the southern states who are saying, you can't take our rights to slavery away. This is, this is part of us, you know? If you can take away the right to own property away, what's next? You just shoot us in the street? So eventually it led to a civil war, right? By the time you get to the early 1900s, uh, ever increasingly what you're seeing is uh, a group of uh, very socialistic uh, big government types had worked their way, especially into the Woodrow Wilson administration. And starting really in uh, 1913, but then also you'll see it recurring in things like the uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, administration in the 1930s and the 1940s, the idea of, well, what exactly is the Constitution? How are we going to use this to do our government, right? And the method that they proposed was what's called the living, breathing Constitution, which is the Constitution is this kind of old, foggy document, and it doesn't really have a whole lot to do with us today. We just need the Constitution to mean what we mean it to mean today. You know, whatever we think it ought to mean. Versus ever increasingly since then, the reaction to that, led by you know, people like Ronald Reagan, Clarence Thomas, who's, who's currently on the Supreme Court, right? Uh, what are often called originalists or people of the original intent, which is, no, these are hard and fast rules that we need to stick to. What was the original intent of the Constitution? Okay? Another group, right? Uh, abortion that I mentioned before. These, these are major constitutional controversies, right? The Constitution protects your life, right? Amendment number five. The Constitution is uh, to protect your life, your liberty, and your property. These, can, these cannot, these three things, or, or no one of these three things, can be taken away from you except by a due process of law. So you go out and you murder somebody, your liberty can be taken away because you've been convicted of the crime and you've sent to prison, okay, for example. Okay? You know, the, the car that you're using to run drugs in okay, can be taken from you after you've been convicted of the crime. All right? But the question, of course, is what is life? Right? How exactly has that uh, worked itself out? And this is, this is a question that the founders, they never really asked themselves. 
This, this was not something that they uh, really thought about for a while. So have some fun with the Constitution. This is where you guys need to start chiming in, right? Okay. Can a state, in a presidential election, so you've got a presidential election, uh, and you know that it's done by electors, right? So, uh, for example, Florida, we have like 27 electors or something like that, 28, uh, I think after the, maybe after the census. And so, uh, if the state wants to designate its tallest citizens, so whoever the tallest, in our case, like 25 or 27 citizens are, can they be the ones that will serve as the electors for president instead of having a popular vote? Is this constitutional or not? You say no? Who else says no? Or yes, or whatever. What do you say? No. You say no? no. You say no? You can't just arbitrarily pick random people off the street to be the electors? That was the one for the monarchy, wouldn't it? What's that? The monarchy. Well, you still have the state legislature determining the, the method of choosing electors. Right? And they do this? And the whole this side of the room is united in there saying, no, this is unconstitutional. Actually, yes, they can. Okay? The Constitution says that the states shall determine their own method for choosing electors for president. So if they wanted to, they could pick the you know, 10 people with the highest IQ if they have 10 electoral votes. Or the 10 tallest citizens. Or you know, have a competition in the 10 ugliest citizens right? Uh, for this. Yeah? Then people still have their own individual right to elect their, their own for... Hang on to that thought. Hang on to that thought. We'll get to this in a second. Now, all the states, though, have chosen to have popular elections. Okay? They have chosen... Uh, to do it that way, right? Uh, for this, all right? So, back here, do you have the right to vote? What's that? You say no, you, you, you jerk, right? I thought we had a right to vote, right? People clamor about this all the time. You, you said we do, we do have a right to vote, right? You have the right you said, to vote, so you lose. Oh, wait a minute, no, I ain't wrong. You say no? Right. Anybody else say no? Just him. Bravery under fire, right? So, okay, so you're the only one. Actually, no. Right? The Constitution nowhere states that it will protect the citizens' right to vote. Also, it states very clearly the states shall determine who gets to vote. Now, I should include there are important modifiers that have come up in the Constitution. Okay, modifiers of the 15th, 19th, and the 26th Amendment. They do say that the states can't use certain factors to determine who can and can't vote. For example. They can, uh, the 15th Amendment says you cannot use race as a factor to determine who to vote. So you can't. You can say, for example, uh, only people who have never committed a felony, only those people can vote. Okay, that is cool. But you can't say, for example, uh, no red Indians. If you're if you're a red-skinned person, you cannot vote. Okay, that that's happening. Right? You cannot you cannot do that. Right. The 19th Amendment, right, 1920, says that you also then can't use gender. Okay, so your normal determining factors. One of them can't be gender. You can't say women can't vote, right? Just because you're a woman. Now, if you're a felon, for example, you might be able to use that, but you can't use women. And then the last one is age, which is uh, over 18. States cannot make you wait any longer than 18. If they want to say, for example, if you want to vote at 17 or 16 or 5, they can do that, but they can't make you wait any longer than 18. Yes? So basically, you don't have a right to vote. You have to allow to vote. Exactly. The states will determine who gets to vote in their... Uh, in their own way, okay? It, so it's not a right, it's a privilege, but that is how, the, the, the government is very interested in people voting because that's how it gets its legitimacy, right? That's how it stays off revolution because if they just got together and said, you know, no one has the right to vote except really, really rich people. They know they get shot, okay? So, that, but that's what, that's how they're supposed to determine. The federal government doesn't have any purview over that except what they consider to be citizenship issues, right? Which is people that, if you're a citizen of the country, basically, uh, you should be allowed to vote. And of course, since you're held as a, you know, a major citizen at the age of 18. That's why they limited it to, you can't set it any higher. They can't, the government can't make you wait to 21 to vote, okay? So that's how that works. What is the role of the president in amending the Constitution? Let's say that you want to be President of the United States, you kiss all the right babies, you shake all the right hands, and you get yourself elected president and say, all right, now I can start amending the Constitution to make it do what, what I want it to do, right? The Constitution actually probably pretty really appreciate that as opposed to you just ignoring it like some presidents do. Right? Uh, so what's the process of a president? What's his role in the Constitution? Yes, sir. The only thing, he, he can't really do anything officially. The only thing he can do is, you know, try to convince Congress to, do, to pass something to do to the state. That is exactly right. His role is spectator. Right? He has no defined role in amending the Constitution. He is not involved officially in any way whatsoever. 
Only Congress and the states can get involved, right? In fact, if you're interested, the states can amend the Constitution without even involving Congress. Congress has the ability to propose amendments, but only the states can ratify. And it requires a three-quarters vote. Three-quarters of the states in the Union have to agree to a constitutional amendment. Two-thirds of them can get together and propose one, but then three-quarters of them uh, are required. And that's the only way three-quarters of the states have to agree. That's it. Congress is not involved in approving amendments. They can only propose them to the states. Okay? So this is it, right? I went in. Thanks a lot for coming.